present on the Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics and on uh, behalf of Montclair State University. I want to welcome you to this very special lecture tonight. Uh, it, it's difficult to avoid hearing or reading something in the news nowadays that doesn't deal with conflicts that seems to pit politics against science. Things like climate change and global warming, and evolution and intelligent design, and alternative energy and fossil fuel. But the good news is that politics and science don't always make strange bedfellows. And in fact, made for a very good mix, as is the case for tonight's speaker. Representative Rush Polk, Congressman from the 12th Congressional District, and a clear congressional go-to guy for science is with us. Dr. Holt earned a BA in physics from Carleton College, an MS and PhD from NYU, also in physics. He was a faculty member at Swarthmore College, where he taught an interesting array of courses that ranged from physics to public policy to religion. During that time, he also worked as a Congressional Science Fellow for U.S. Representative Bob Edgar of Pennsylvania. Dr. Holt served as Acting Chief for the Nuclear and Scientific Division of the Office of Strategic Forces from 1987 to 1989. He moved to Princeton University as Assistant Director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, the university's largest research facility and the largest center for energy research in New Jersey, where he in fact was an active researcher, publishing in peer-reviewed journals, well-recognized journals, and in fact, he holds a patent on a method for maintaining the correct density gradient in a non-conducting solar pump, essentially a solar device. But politics is in his genes. His father, at age 29, was the youngest person ever elected to the U.S. Senate. His mother served as Secretary of State of West Virginia and was the first woman to hold that position. Dr. Holt became Congressman Holt in 1998 elected as a Democrat to the 106th Congress, and he has since been re-elected re five times. Congressman Holt is currently the only physicist in the U.S. House of Representatives. But some of you may know him equally well as a five-time winner of the game show Jeopardy, <laughs> and one of two members of Congress to have participated in a non-televised Jeopardy competition against the IBM computer Watson, an event to promote innovation. And in fact, Congress is all invested in the computer in its individual matchup. Representative, <laughs> Representative Holt is a strong voice for his constituents. He serves on the Committee on Education and the Workforce and the Committee on Natural Resources. From 2007 to 2010, Congressman Holt was chair of the Select Intelligence Oversight Panel. He served on the National Commission on Mathematics and Science Teaching for the 21st Century, and is co-chair of the Research and Developing Caucus. He sits on congressional caucuses concerning children's environmental health, renewable energy, sustainable development, Alzheimer's, diabetes, biomedical research, the internet, farmland protection, human rights, and women's right to choose. He's a vice chair of the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. Representative Holt helped secure more than $700 million in new federal funding for science and technology research. He pushed the, to pass it legislation providing millions in funding for protecting open space, and he was instrumental in adding the Lower Delaware River to the National Wild and Scenic River Program. As a member of the House Committee on Education and Labor, Congressman Holt helped write the College Cost Reduction Act. This was the largest college aid expansion since the GI Bill, and a bill that includes a provision to provide upfront tuition assistance for math, science, and foreign language teachers. And that is just scratching the surface of this outstanding member of Congress. I was put on here, but we're here to hear Representative Holt. We're going to hear him tonight express his thoughts on the politics of science and the science of politics. Please welcome Congressman Russia. Thanks for the generous. 
this introduction. I, uh, a uh, journalist said to me uh, a while back that whatever else I do in my life, my tombstone will say Jeopardy contestant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, tonight, and uh, I uh, look forward to some interaction uh, with you as we go along. Uh, I'd like to talk about, yes, the politics of science, uh, the science of politics. Um, maybe uh, another title would be Thinking Like a Scientist or Liberal Questioning. Um, I, I'm always uh, very aware of the, kind of the university paradox at a time like this when I come to the podium, which was stated so well by Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice when she said that uh, we all love to instruct, uh, although we can only teach that which is not worth knowing. Uh, so <laughs> that's, uh, um, the, uh, so I, I hope to, to spur some thinking uh, with the understanding that, uh, that it's only that way that one learns. Um, The, um, uh, let me set the stage by saying, you know, at a university, it's kind of roughly fair to say that half of what you learn isn't true, or is at least incomplete. The problem is figuring out which half. And in my line of work in Washington, sort of half of the steps that we will take to energize our economy won't work. The problem is deciding which half. Well, essentially, science is about that. Um, I, I suppose everybody thinks that they have an idea of what is science. Um, for most Americans, it is cut and dry. Uh, black and white, hard and fast, and pretty dull. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think that science adds an exciting dimension to our knowledge of the world. In fact, it is probably, as it's sometimes described, uh, the most reliable way of understanding our world. Uh, so I, I get a joy and a satisfaction out of adding science to the other aspects of my life, uh, the other ways of knowing and thinking and explaining. Um, but I think most, many Americans would uh, agree with the thought of Walt Whitman in his poem, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. Some of you may know that uh, poem. And it was, you know, when the proofs and the figures and, the, and were ranged in columns before me, uh, that he got sort of dizzy. And he said, uh, I had to leave the room and go out and look at the stars. Uh, <laughs> uh, that that he, he didn't share the, the uh, satisfaction I get in looking at the stars, uh, enjoying them aesthetically, but also getting a, a, a greater understanding that you know Fraunhofer showed 200 years ago by splitting the light into its spectral colors, uh, that the stars were made of the same elements that you see in the fireplace flame or in a candle. Uh, that uh, you really have a richer understanding of it. But what I wanted to talk about tonight is the essence of science and how it applies to our nation, to your lives, to uh, our world uh, today. I've wrestled over the years with the most succinct, meaningful definition I can find of science, and it is this. It's a way of asking questions so that they can be answered empirically and verifiably. 
And there are, real, there are lots of implications that flow from that very simple definition. But it starts with asking, framing questions. The famous scientist I. I. Robbie, Nobel Prize winning physicist, advisor to presidents and so forth, uh, late professor at Columbia, was once asked why was he so successful. He said, well, it's really pretty simple. I grew up on the Lower East Side of New York, and all of the immigrant families there valued education. And after school, every family, every parent asked the children, what did you learn in school today? He said that my, children, my parents were different. And after school each day, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question? He said, that's the key to my success. Well, asking questions so that they can be answered empirically, based on observation, evidence, experimentation, and verifiably, so that your answer is not for yourself alone, but it is for others to check your work and for you to apply your answer more broadly. I hasten to say when I talk about so glowingly about science tonight, I'm not proposing that everyone be a scientist, God forbid. Um, you know, there's a shortage of lab coats. Um, but I would like to see everyone acquainted with scientific thinking. Every third grader can do it. In fact, third graders are very good at it. Our challenge is to avoid telling the third graders and the fourth graders and the eighth and the twelfth graders that they have to decide if they're going to be scientists or not. And if not, maybe they don't need to take those calculus and physics courses. Um, they're scientists and they're non-scientists. Well, I certainly would like to do away with that division. Now, socially, the division does exist. There are some different ways of thinking. I certainly see it in Congress. So if science is intended to lead you to ask questions, so they can be answered verifiably. A, a, a necessary ingredient of, con of, of, of science is that it be uh, expressed in, in, in a way that others can uh, take part in your reasoning, uh, challenge your thinking. A marvelous, there's a marvelous universality in science. It is not for one person alone. Uh, it is very generalizable. That is a characteristic of it. And the reason uh, scientists often use math and express their, their ideas with a fairly rigorous logic is uh, so that it can have this universality, so that there's a common language. You know, it's only perversions of science, such as Nazi science, that would say, uh, it, uh, yeah, they would exclude uh, Einstein, uh, for example. Uh, it's only perversions of science that are narrow, uh, regional, uh, or uh, uh, parochial. So if science is generally thought to be universal in application, universal in language, um, progressive, it's based on an idea that you can learn more and more, that you can, that, that there is a movement toward uh, a, 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 a better understanding. Whereas in Congress, uh, what we do usually is, is not, uh, uh, it is really local and specific in the sense that you're dealing with you know, specific pieces of legislation. Uh, it is not uh, meant to be extended to other countries 
universities. Uh, it is uh, quite local. And whereas science is based on this provisional premise that what you know, well, the way we physicists describe it, is what you think you know can easily be overturned by a patent clerk from Switzerland. Um, with a reference to Einstein. Um, you always have to keep in mind that what you know might be overturned by that patent clerk. Um, it's a very democratic, small d, democratic idea. But the greatest scientists of the age had their ideas displaced by this 26-year-old upstart. It doesn't happen in Congress. It's hierarchical. The committee chair actually has the last word. <coughs> but what we get out of science, and this is why it's so important for us to encourage the third graders, is a sense of that the, a sense of sense, that the world makes sense, that it's not capricious, that you can find some order in the world around us. Now you have to be careful, of course, how you apply the methods of science. Uh, you want to make sure that others check your work. It's not good science to say, if on successive days you consume excessive amounts of scotch and water and bourbon and water and vodka and water and say the water makes you drunk. <laughs> uh, it, is, um, it, it is a, a, a kind of a warning that you have to uh, apply the methods of science in an open and self-critical way. We put Galileo on a pedestal, not because he had the last word about science. There's much we understand about the world, the universes, uh, that Galileo couldn't possibly have known. But he was, at least symbolically, the person who banished magical thinking from our daily lives and put it into the carnivals uh, rather than into our politics and our consumer affairs. He didn't invent the telescope, but he uh, developed it. Uh, he was shrewd, uh, paid shrewd attention to his uh, uh, grant makers and uh, realized that they might uh, keep him well supplied uh, if he uh, showed military applications for his telescope. And he was able to do a lot of interesting work, looking, discovering the moons <coughs> of Jupiter, discovering that uh, there were mountains on our own moon, the, the terrestrial moon, and most importantly, to turn his telescope at the sun, discover what we call sunspots, and declare to the world that the sun is not a perfect celestial sphere. Because at the time, people thought, well, the heavens are, are, are governed by one set of laws, and we on Earth are governed by other physical laws. And he showed there is really a great commonality applicability of the basic laws of science widely. And I mentioned earlier that a couple of centuries later, the German spectroscopist Fraunhofer turned his spectroscope on the sun and said, my god, there's iron there. And there's carbon there. And then they found this mysterious element turned out to be helium. They named it for the sun. Helium, and lo and behold, they found it on the Earth, too. And ever since Galileo, there has been this 
understanding that there is an order to the universe. It's not every part of the universe governed by its own set of laws that bear no relation. No, you can explain everything from ocean currents to human behavior by subjecting your hypotheses to experimental tests and observation. And as I say, banish magical thinking to the carnivals. Well, Mark Twain had some, uh, had a particularly interesting way of expressing this. Actually, I, I approach Mark Twain with some trepidation because some of you may know uh, and, and want to invoke his, his description of uh, Congress. Uh, he said, uh, now, suppose I were an idiot. Now, suppose I were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. <laughs> or, or Twain also said, uh, there's no distinctly criminal class in the United States, with the exception of Congress. Or he, he said, uh, uh, all parliaments and congresses uh, have a kindly feeling toward idiots <laughs> by virtue of personal experience and heredity. <laughs> but with regard to science, he uh, had a lot of fun uh, extrapolating extrapolation, uh, carrying it to laughable extremes. He noted that uh, the Mississippi, which he had plied as a riverboat man, uh, at times of huge floods would cut through the meandering curves of this river and form separated oxbows. And then where the river cut through, of course, the total course of the river will be shorter. And he said that so, uh, Geologists can, can therefore prove that in uh, a million years ago, next November, the Mississippi River was a million miles long. Uh, and 747 years from now, the Mississippi River will be a mile and a half long. <laughs> well, uh, stick with me, because here's what I was leading up to. <laughs> his, uh, uh, his summary statement was, the marvelous thing about science is that you get such a wholesale return of conjecture for such a trifling investment of fact. <laughs> well, he was getting a, a good laugh uh, out, of, uh, out of his ridicule there. But he was closer to the truth uh, than he thought. Uh, the marvelous thing about science is its generalizability. It's its uh, capability of helping us think. Because from science, you have the very best way in your life, or in mine, or in public policy, to avoid self-deception. You can generalize what you observe and subject it to test. So that anyone can challenge your work. In effect, then, this challenges rigid thinking. That's what Galileo, that's the course that Galileo set us on. Now, the science that has developed from that, and here I'll say a couple of words about the politics of science, uh, is really quite, quite capable. There are many things about floods and minerals and materials that we can explain from these now highly developed methods of science. And it gets political now when in Washington we are called on to decide on funding for science agencies, how much we should invest in research and development, and whether we should give tax benefits to companies for engaging in research and development. And 
whether we should fund science education in the schools, and whether in the schools science should have a privileged position or whether it should just be another subject, another elective. Whether we have prospected for enough rare earth elements to make our electronic devices. And whether high, in, high pressure injection of fluids to fracture the shale in the earth to release the natural gas might also induce earthquakes. A lot of politics involved in all of those questions. And one would hope that there would be enough scientific expertise in the policy making bodies, including the legislature, to make those decisions wisely. Well, unfortunately, there isn't enough. There aren't enough scientists. Now, I hope we can get more scientists in Congress, but really it is only temporary that I hope that is true, because what I hope more is that we will get to the point where every educated person is comfortable thinking about scientific questions. Members of Congress are quite comfortable thinking about things, talking about things, voting on things in which they are not expert. Now, I say that for a laugh, but you better hope that's true, because you can't, you're not going to find 435 people who are expert in everything that affects your life, and everything that you will be calling on them to make decisions about. So whether it's transportation, or international affairs, or economics, members of Congress, yes, will vote on things in which they are not expert, but when it comes to science, they'll say, oh, I'd better leave that to the scientists. So until we can get to that golden age where every well-educated person is comfortable dealing with scientific questions, and therefore every one of their representatives in the legislature is, comfort is similarly comfortable, uh, we actually need more scientists in the process. But I'll tell you what we need even more. And this gets at the science of politics. We need to recapture what has been the traditional American way of thinking, which is thinking like a scientist. For our first couple of centuries, we were not a nation of trained scientists, but we were a nation of people thinking like scientists. Every farmer, every shopkeeper, every factory worker was thinking about how things work and how to make them better. It was an idea that really goes back to our founders. Our Constitution, and I always carry a copy, not because I don't know what's in it, but I just like to keep it close. It is such an ingenious document. And it was very much based on scientific principles. The Federalist Papers that were the, the arguments for the ratification of this document by the various states mentions uses the word experimentation or experiment 45 times, the word democracy only 10 times. They realized that they were doing away with a rigid system of government, the monarchy. And they were going to replace it with something else that they hoped would not be rigid. They hoped it would be progressive in the sense that it would move toward a more perfect union, that it would move toward greater, uh, a, a greater embracing of diversity, that it would move toward 
greater prosperity. <coughs> Science was what they embraced. It was, and, and you don't think of them as scientists exactly. Frank Franklin, of course, Benjamin Franklin, you certainly do. He's the greatest scientist of his day, worldwide. Most famous and probably most accomplished. But Madison studied science and math at Princeton. Adams studied astronomy and math at Harvard. Payne did experiments, Thomas Payne did experiments on gases and speculated on life and other planets. They were thinking about ideas, subjecting their hypotheses to testing, and discarding their ideas when they didn't hold up. That was the kind of country they created that replaced the rigid monarchy with a more flexible, Experiment. So that's what I mean when I say every farmer, every shopkeeper, every factory worker, and some generalization here, of course, not every single one, but it was pervasive throughout our society. The, the greatest praise you could give to a person, the hero in the town, was the inventor. And this was important not because it gave us new gadgets and new techniques and new processes for making steel, but because it helped us avoid ideological stasis. It helped us break out of the rigidity of thinking that is human nature. You see, scientists are no less arrogant than anyone else. I think there are some who would argue they might be more so. They are no less <coughs> subject to falling prey to self-deception. I mean, in their in their character. They are no, uh, more, um, they're no less rigid in their thinking if they stop being scientists. Because when they become scientists, they buy into the idea of progress get beyond the static understanding of what you know right now. And they buy into the idea that their work is to be criticized. That's why scientists publish. That's why you have journals. So your work can be checked. So that you don't hold your ideas to yourself and become locked in your own ideas. There's a kind of enforced humility. No scientist likes to be confronted by those other scientists who are who live who seem to live for no reason other than to disprove you, to throw out your ideas. No scientist likes that, but they've all signed up for it. It's the nature of the process. And it is our, well, as Lewis Thomas, the biologist, said, it's our shrewdest maneuver for understanding how the world works. Or as, as others have said, it's our best protection against self-deception. Galileo didn't actually phrase it this way, but I think he understood and subsequent generations of scientists have understood that the easiest person to deceive is yourself. And so the question is, how do you avoid that? How do you build in a protection so that you grow, so that you move,
and so that you do fewer and fewer stupid things as you go along. Well, that's science. It's based on an inherent doubt and provisionality of what you do. It is keeping that patent clerk in the back of your mind. It is advertising your doubts, writing those into your paper when you present your, your hypothesis, and inviting others to check your work. In the United States, science and liberty sustained each other. This kind of free thinking that allowed us to make liberty the conception of our country. Remember, as Lincoln said, the nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal. He didn't think of himself as a scientist, but listen to those words. That's what he's talking about. Conceived in this idea of free inquiry, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of economic activity, and dedicated to the proposition not the law, not the declaration, not the edict, the proposition that all are created equal, yet subject to testing. We are engaged in a great weather, civil war, he said, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Very scientific. He wouldn't have called himself a scientist, but how can you, I don't see any way to approach that except to say he was thinking like a scientist. I, I could go on and develop the ideas of how, and there's an interesting book I recommend to you by Tim Ferriss, the science writer, who, who uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Science of Liberty. And he spent, uh, spends the whole book developing our ideas of, of, of liberty, of civil rights, of, uh, uh, of equality, uh, of opportunity, uh, to these scientific roots. And in some cases, the, the specific scientific thinking of our, uh, of our founders. I don't, I don't think I will go through, uh, uh, through all of that, except to make a, a, a few points. The, um, and and I, I'll, I'll wind up in a couple of minutes here, and I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on these things, or actually anything else that's on your mind. But, Climate change is an issue that's, you know, it's, it's an interesting example of what we're talking about. First of all, what we know about climate change comes in part from looking at other planets and generalizing our laws and say, well, we have no reason to believe that the laws that govern the oven that is Venus or the oxygen-deprived atmosphere that is Mars are any different than the laws that govern our planet. And they might have gone through some, some evolution that will teach us something about our own. 
Now, to actually do the climate studies, the planetary science, calls for scientific training. And I, as I said earlier, I'm not asking that everybody become a technical scientist. But I really would like everyone to think critically about climate change. Well, why do we think we're changing our very climate by the way we release gases? Is it plausible that a blanket of carbon dioxide is, uh, is just like a swimming pool cover or a blanket on your bed. It actually holds the heat in. Well, there are questions about exactly how it would work. And so we end up with people in Washington and around the country who are saying, you see, the scientists don't agree, so all bets are off. It's a hoax. Actually, there's a my colleagues on the Senate side, on the other side of the Capitol, uses that word. He just published a book. A hoax. Well, science was never meant to give us certainty. What it does is give us a, a way to play the odds. And the odds are pretty good. We're changing our <coughs> climate. And the odds are pretty good that the way we're changing our climate, and by the way, the emphasis is on we changing the climate. You know, humans are not the only factor here, and that's kind of part of the dispute. Uh, but we are a significant contributing factor. I'd say the odds are, are quite good. And the odds are quite good that this is going to be very costly to us in lives and dollars. Uh, and so we should be looking for ways to, to deal with that. It calls for a kind of scientific thinking that doesn't mean you have to be an expert. But it allows you to be a good citizen. The debates about economics, I could go into some length about that, I won't. Suffice it to say that economics is empirical. I mean, the, the, the mechanisms may be not very transparent on the micro or macro economic scale. But it's certainly subject to test. And if you would approach it with a scientific mind, asking questions so that they can be answered empirically and verifiably, you can learn a lot. Those of you who can think back and remember a decade ago, or, or not quite a decade ago, will remember there was an issue about whether we should go to war with Iraq. And I would hope, I would have hoped, that our intelligence officers had been thinking more like scientists rather than asserting that there were weapons of mass destruction. They were not subjecting their thoughts to empirical test. They were not saying their, their, uh, 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 their ideas were provisional. They were not setting their, uh, their thinking up for uh, contradiction. They were not looking for the, uh, uh, the, the counter evidence. They were, this 
deceiving themselves, and in the process, deceived much of the country uh, at huge cost. And just one more comment about science, scientific thinking in our political lives. Right now, there's a lot of talk about the New York City Police Department coming into New Jersey, into universities, into halal food stores, into any places where they think there might be concentrations of Muslims to kind of observe. I think the word might be surveil or spy, but um, <laughs> they're doing this to protect you and me, they say. But they're violating some, uh, some basic, some, some, some uh, they're, they're, they're violating some basic behavior that scientific thinking would lead them to. Take the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. It's a protection against search and seizure of your property without a search warrant that is obtained from an independent judicial officer. In other words, the enforcement or the intelligence officers should be able to show an independent judge that they know what they're doing, that they have probable cause to suspect this person, that they are they have reason to violate the basic American principle of equality, non-hierarchy, because of evidence. Profiling is not that. Profiling is lazy policing. Profiling is uncritical policing. Profiling is not subjecting your ideas to somebody else's challenge. The Fourth Amendment was not created for some abstract reason to defend civil rights. No, it was a very practical reason. These guys were very practical. They said, you will be safer. The police can do a better job of protecting you if they are required at every step of the way to show an independent person that they know what they're doing, that they are, can go before a judge and get a search warrant. And if they can't, they can't search and seize your property. This was developed by Madison and others in a very scientific way of thinking. So what we need in this country is not more trained scientists necessarily, although it would hurt. What we need is to undo what was done in 1958. That's, the, that's where I date our loss of science. And it's interesting because for many of us, that was our key to science. What happened in 1958? Well, in a panicky reaction to a little beeping Soviet satellite called Sputnik, the National Defense Education Act was passed, put a lot of money into science education. There were curricula, curricular developments, and a lot of us got grants to study science. It was wonderful, except that we said, we're going to create a generation of scientists and engineers, the likes of which the world has never seen. And we're going to call them scientists and engineers and technicians, and we're going to leave behind the other 80% of the population. 
So they will be told, if you're not going to be a scientist, then you don't need to think like that. And I think we're living with the residue, the effects, the damage, really, of this really very good, but very flawed piece of legislation that accentuated the two cultures in our society. And in a subtle but very real way, stamp out the characteristic American way of thinking, which is asking questions so that they can be answered empirically and verifiably. That is thinking like a scientist, I would argue, thinking like an American. of the folks back home. Uh, members of Congress are very good. They are altruistic. They are hardworking. They are conscientious. They are, the vast majority of them are, are, are honest and, and dedicated. Uh, but like most Americans, they are uncomfortable with science and would have a hard time explaining what's wrong with creationism. They, most of them would say, oh no, I, I, you know, there's, evolution is real. Well, why do you say that? And why does it matter? Uh, they'd be hard pressed to come up with a cogent argument. Um, why does it matter? Well, because an awful lot of our world makes more sense in terms of evolution. Now, I talked about a, um, a, a, a non-animistic evolution when I was talking about comparing our planet's atmosphere to some other planet's atmospheres. You know, it, you can learn something by seeing how a planet might have evolved. Uh, similarly, you can learn how this medicine, this pharmaceutical drug, is going to work uh, against bacteria if you think of it in evolutionary context, in an evolutionary context. Uh, so that's why it matters. Uh, it's not because it's humanism versus religion. No, it's because the world makes a lot more sense. And you can uh, improve your quality of life uh, if, if you put things in evolutionary terms. Things like science. And so, you know, that's... Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking like a science, that's right. And <laughs> members, of, members of Congress uh, are, by and large, no better than your well-educated friends at dealing with that question. Uh, so creationism, intelligent design, uh, and, and, and you can think of some other examples. Hi, um, 
Janine Hardy. I'm a faculty member here at Montclair State and a doctoral student in the higher education department. And I was, uh, my proposed dissertation topic uh, has to deal with the underrepresentation of minority faculty in the STEM fields. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I recently got an email from the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights, which uh, their data specifically shows that uh, schools in the K through 12 districts with high minority enrollment are not even offered calculus. What do you, what in your opinion is the root cause of the underrepresentation of minority faculty and what can research universities and schools do to solve the problem? Well, I think you put your finger on what I would say is the principal reason, which is that, um, that education is a very personal thing. And how you do in history or English or math or physics uh, depends on who you interact with. Primarily the teacher, but also your peers. And so that if there, uh, so, so that if there is a dearth of, of science teachers, you know, well prepared, uh, enthusiastic. Science teachers in, uh, uh, in minority communities, in their schools and in the community, it takes generations to get out of it. Um, you know, there are some ways around it, but uh, you know the, the the legacy of racial discrimination in this country is runs deep. Not just in the STEM fields; I mean, it's in all sorts of areas. Um, but to overcome it in in the schools um, it takes either an enormous effort, which we have not made, or generations. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to say about it, but I I would say it's, that that's the, the gist of it. I've seen examples where it is. And part of the problem is, when it comes to science in particular, in the, in the science and the math, is that um, the assessors lose sight of the, the, kind of the basics of science. That's why I've tried to simplify this. You know, Asking questions so they can be answered empirically and verifiable. It's a simple definition, but it goes a long way. And if you lose sight of that and you start testing for too many specific, <coughs> narrow you know, bits, uh, it's study 
science in the first place. Uh, unless you want to be a scientist who memorizes all of those little bits. Um, but that's not the essence of science. That's stamp collecting. That's not science. Uh, so I think it was Kelvin who said that. I forget who it was. But, uh, um, anyway, th th there is a lot to be said about that. But I think it can be done well. Uh, I would hope that here, you know, I know that this is an important, this is a hotbed of educational innovation. Uh, I mean, this university. So I hope this university is working on improved assessments in science and the STEM fields. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, you said that, that members of Congress, by and large, are uncomfortable with science. And given that a large number of decisions Who do they look to get advice and guidance to help them guide their decisions? Um, you know, most of the time, they operate oblivious of the science. So it's not that they're anti-science, they're just kind of ascientific. They just, what worries me most is the way Congress deals with those subjects that are not explicitly scientific, but have significant scientific components. If it's explicitly scientific, they know where to go to ask. Now, they still do some stupid things. I mean, right now, the NSF is, is um, looking at two, uh, the United States participation in two international giant telescopes. Uh, these are Earth-based telescopes. Um, and one of the senators put some language in a bill last year that said uh, the NSF could only fund the telescope that would be based in the United States. Well, I mean, if you want to observe the Southern Hemisphere, for example, <laughs> uh, that doesn't work so well. You know, there, there's, there's half, like, half the universe is in that other hemisphere. Um, so, so even on explicitly scientific things, uh, sometimes um, parochial, unscientific thinking finds its way in. Uh, but usually, if it's and uh, you know whether to fund human spaceflight and NASA and all of that. Um, they manage to get expertise. Now, it doesn't mean the decisions are always right, uh, but they manage to get expertise. What worries me are those countless areas that have scientific and technical components, but not explicitly. An example that comes to my mind that I've gotten involved in a lot is voting, you know, elections. Ten years ago, after all the trouble with the uh, hanging chads and pregnant chads and butterfly ballots in Florida uh, in the presidential election of 2000, Congress passed legislation that didn't explicitly require electronic voting machines, but essentially drove, drove many of the jurisdictions to go out and purchase purely electronic touchscreen voting machines. Sounds neat, sounds modern except that anyone who has worked with computers knows computers can't debug themselves. And other people's work is notoriously difficult to debug. And if there is an error in the software, either accidental or deliberate, your vote won't be recorded the way you thought it was recorded, and nobody will ever know. So, Here's something that I was able to present this problem to computer types. Actually, they presented it to me first. They came to me yelling and screaming, do you see what's happening here? And I presented it to political types without any science background. And they said, what are you, a Luddite? You know, don't you like, are you anti-technology? And I said, no, I'm just, you know, in favor of integrity in elections. And, and part of that requires audits. And there's no way you can audit this stuff. 
because you have no idea what behind that curtain the voter intended to do. So you can't match the voter's intention with the recorded uh, with the recorded vote. On a paper ballot, you can because the voter herself or himself knows whether it's recorded the way he, she or he intended. But that's just one example of something where the science immediately got it, said, oh my god. And the non-scientists still don't get it. Uh, New Jersey is still wedded to these electronic voting machines without any auditability. Um, and they think it's just fine. Or, you know, the, the previous Secretary of State, the current Secretary of State, uh, the Secretary doesn't buy the machines, but the Secretary runs the, the election system. And uh, the counties or towns would have to buy the machines, but or just buy paper to not use the machines. Um, but there are countless examples like that uh, where a federal law uh, has uh, would benefit from uh, scientific thinking in the in the right. absent because nobody thought to ask scientists. They asked the companies that make the machines. Uh, and sure enough, the, the companies said, oh yeah, our machines are completely reliable. And nobody would ever hack them. Uh, but, yeah, I, I um, you took out the Constitution before, and I carried it for my classes, too, and I wanted to ask you about Probably the most detailed section is Article One that defines the role of the legislature. The legislature right? yes. I, and I um, had a group of high school students in Washington yesterday, and I pointed out the Constitution. <laughs> after the preamble, it begins with the legislature. The so, people, and there it begins with the people's house. I'm not sure. And it also defines um, <clears throat> in Section Eight of Article One. There's a clause in there that says uh, the roles. One of the roles is to promote the progress of science. And I am under the impression that the 535 members of Congress are sworn to uphold the Constitution. And you have a fellow that you alluded to, and I believe he's from the Panhandle State, who wrote a book, Senator Imhoff, about the hoax. And how can they justify that stance when they sworn to promote the progress of science? Um, well, if I were going, you know, if I had a lot more time or if we were going to, you know, have a book length discussion, I would have talked about the fact that, again, to bolster my argument, that our founders were really scientists. Uh, they had a very general document. It, it, it's, you know, it's ingenious in its generality and its vagueness, um, except when it comes to patents. And it was very specific. It says, you know, we will give people exclusive rights to sell their inventions um, because they understood that this would, you know, by making it exclusive, you would actually uh, accelerate <coughs> the dissemination of the technology. Um, a little counter counterintuitive, but ingenious. Uh, it didn't, I mean, this had been tried in, in, in England, uh, so it wasn't a brand new idea, but they were thinking like science. Um, but beyond that, there, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to think like a scientist. It's just, it just permeates the whole document. Um, and so, you know, I think most Americans, most public officials, most office holders um, don't even think about this. They don't even, they don't think they have an obligation to think like a scientist. Um, you know, the, the, the First Amendment that we talk about is giving us the right to free speech. In a very real sense, it gives us the obligation to free speech. <laughs> the reason is, so you can have this kind of communication, which is uh, 
common among scientists. It's the bread and butter of scientists, this kind of open communication. So it was not for some abstract reason that they put in freedom of communication of ideas. It was for a very practical reason. Um, but I think most, uh, most public officials don't think of it in the terms that I've been describing it tonight. And, you know, you, and we, we, of course, there's no way to enforce and actually no reason to expect good decision-making by an individual. The whole point is we have a system, checks and balances and all that, that are set up to give us good decision-making despite the human frailties, despite the human biases, despite the human prejudices and uh, Illogic. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah great, great questions. I'm enjoying the, the discussion. Thanks. Would be what? Well, I mean, I think you maybe carried the algae example a little bit far to say this represents the demise of the American way of life or something. But, 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 but you're right that it's it, uh, it's not surprising. <laughs> it's not surprising that the, uh, a person's initial reaction is, well, algae? No, 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 no we're talking gasoline. Gasoline comes from the ground. Well, if you press them a little bit, and you say, well, how did it get in the ground? Well, the best theory we have is this is dec decayed plant matter. And algae is what? It's a plant. Well, in fact, you know, you can make a connection, and if you forget that this is, I mean, if you can put aside the fact that this is growing in water, and water is not something you usually want to put in your gas tank. Um, um, you know, if you listen to these people, you understand these things are very efficient photosynthetic uh, uh, machines. And they can grow better than corn can grow. And so if you want to make some alcohol or other kinds of hydrocarbons, uh, uh, you can, yeah, algae looks pretty promising. Um, is that going to power our transportation? certainly worth looking at, and, uh, you know, we've got to get, I, I, I was concerned a little bit on the solar energy thing, on this whole cylindra matter, that's become a joke also, uh, and I've said to my friends, you know, uh, uh, who, who have been ridiculing this, uh, do you want, uh, do, do you expect every risky venture to succeed? Uh, then they're not risky ventures. Uh, uh, on balance, that particular program in 
which Solyndra got hundreds of millions of dollars and failed, um, that program has been successful on balance. Others, other things have succeeded, or probably will. Um, uh, two other things that I neglected to say in, in response to a couple of these questions. One had to do with uh, education. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act is way overdue for reauthorization. No child left behind uh, will be no more. I mean, one of these days we will do away with it because nobody likes it anymore. Nobody, you know, it's, it's not working. Um, one of the things I did manage to get into that legislation was in addition to testing for math and science, I mean math and, and reading, uh, I also got science. So that will be tested. Now, will it be tested well? That depends on each state's standards. Um, and, but I was unable to get it counted. So, you know, s schools are evaluated on the basis of their uh, math and reading tests. The students have to take the science test, but nobody counts it, which is you know, kind of the worst of both. Uh, uh, the other comment I wanted to make about Congress and where we get our advice, uh, there used to be something uh, for about two and a half decades called the Office of Technology Assessment. It was a congressional agency. It produced uh, many dozens, maybe a hundred or two reports each year on everything from missile defense to telecommunications to Alzheimer's disease. Policy questions uh, about those, in those issue areas. And often on topics of obvious or large technology, Components. And in what came to be known as the Gingrich Revolution in 1995, just after the Republicans took control of the House for the first time in, in many decades, uh, they abolished the OTA. Uh, one of my former colleagues called it a self imposed congressional lobotomy. But, the, but the, the idea that they would say, we don't want to know. I mean, it was not a particularly expensive agency. Yeah, I mean, it was a couple of tens of millions of dollars. So those were taxpayer dollars. You know, we would want them to be well spent. But in fact, I can demonstrate that the Office of Technology Assessment saved us taxpayers many times more than the cost of the agency by avoiding some bad decisions. Um, the Social Secu Security computer system, for one. Anyway, uh, uh, what they were going to do. So anyway, doing away with OTA uh, uh, what was a really bad move. And most of my colleagues don't miss it. Republicans and Democrats. Don't miss it. They don't understand that we were getting stuff from it because they weren't paying any attention to that kind of thing. And they don't seem to think that we need that kind of technological advice now. I've tried every session. I've been in Congress now. I'm now in my seventh term. I've tried every term to revive OTA. So far, without success, I, I've got you know 20, 30 people who seem to really care about it. I had a vote last year, and I got up to 180 people. You need 218 to make a majority. Um, so you know, I got quite a few votes for reviving OTA, but only a couple dozen people really care, really get it, and um, so I'll keep working on it. But it's. It's one of the problems we face. Well, um, I, you all have been a patient audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, great to be here.